Okay, so I'm going to attempt to do a story of my life without it being scripted, just kind of bad. Just trying to talk about some of the things I've been through, if I can remember correctly. For those of you that want to know more about me, this is going to be quite long because I am an old lady, but I'll see what I can do. So let's get started. This is going to be a bit hard and I'll probably get shit out of order, but um, let me preface this <laughs> by saying that I had promised my aunt that I would not talk about my past because my birth father doesn't like it being out there. And I had the story of my life out. I took it down for two different reasons. One reason was because the trolls and the hate sites got a hold of it and they took everything that I've been through and they said that it was a lie, it was bullshit, nobody could be through, like go through all that and it was just for attention. I mean, they basically used everything I've been through against me, which fucking sucked. It's my life. It's what I've been through. It's what actually happened. And for them to just reduce it to, to nothing, I wasn't going to have it out there for that. Also, after my dad died, my mom is mental and stuff now. And, you know, she doesn't really know me. She doesn't know anything. And I've been finding out that most of my childhood and things that she had told me were actually lies. I don't really know what the truth is anymore. I don't really know much about my parents or my past. I don't really know much about anything that's happened. Um, I was young when my parents divorced and, you know, he said one thing, she said something else. I always believed her because he abandoned me and haven't had anything to do with him since I was like 11. And, um, of course, I'm going to believe my mom who was there for me and stuff. And then I found out that she lied about a lot of stuff she told me. And so I don't know who the real victim is. I don't know what happened. That's between them. It, it's something I will never know. So I thought I've, I've always wanted nothing more than to have a family. You know, I see other people they have the moms, they have dads, brothers, sisters. I don't have that, even though I have a mom and a dad and a stepmom and a stepdad and I have half brothers and half sisters or I have stepbrothers and stepsisters and half sisters I am not close to any of them I like I get so envious seeing somebody post like this is my sister I get my sister and it's like fuck you know I, I don't have a family really for all intents and purposes I don't have a family all I have is my son and my husband you know not saying I don't have a family but I don't have like sibling parent type family and so um, he didn't like it being out there so I said I wouldn't put it out there maybe he'll want to talk to me you know have me in his life if I if I remove the shit that embarrasses him or that he says isn't true even though he wasn't there for half of it and I wrote him so many times and I apologize for putting our family story out there and he hasn't written it's been years like it's been about three years now I think and he hasn't even bothered to write me he's known where I am because he's watched my YouTube but he's never once tried to reach out to me or talk to me and at this point you know I just feel like I owe him nothing I owe random people online who watch and get inspiration and help from me more than I owe my own birth father who refuses to even speak to me even though I am his firstborn so I'm sorry but I'm going to say what needs to be said. I won't go into as much detail, but I will still talk about what I've been through. And these are situations I've been through that I remember that I go over again and again and again in my head. Like how my head works is there is no past. There is no present. It's all present. Like if it happened to me five years ago, it's like it happened yesterday. I remember everything currently. Everything is still floating around in my head constantly. I don't know why. I don't know if it's my BPD. I don't know if it's just because I'm mental. Must be mental, but that's what it is. You know, everything is just in my head. So the things I went through in my childhood, this is how I remember them. And this is exactly how I remember everything for the things that I do remember. So my parents split up when I was about, I'd say six years old. And I had a really hard childhood growing up once I left because um, my stepmom hated me. 
Now, I have spoken to my one of my sisters, and she said that my stepmom was young. She was like in her 20s, and she wasn't very good at being a mom or a new mom. She didn't really know what was going on, and so she was really angry all the time. She couldn't handle her temper, and I'm like, yeah, well, you know, she fucking, she let me have it quite a bit. Um, my parents split up because of her, well, I don't know if it was because of her, but she was my mom's best friend, ran off with my dad. That's what happened. And my dad took me, my mom says he took me to hurt her because I was her baby. I was the second born and I don't know what the real reason is. I just know that he took me and in my head it's for revenge just to hurt my mom because I remember him taking me, uh, when I was still with her and he had visitation rights, he would take me and try to get me to tell him where her and her boyfriend lived and he would, he wanted to know everything about their life and I was young so I didn't know what the hell was going on. I, I tried to direct him to her house and I couldn't and she told me that he had stalked her, chased her out of the whole state of Georgia and um, he got her water shut off, her power shut off. She was like cooking in the yard, eating in the yard. Uh, she had it quite hard because of him and the shit that he put her through. I've also heard from siblings that, you know, like he used to rape my mom and like lock her in the closet and he'd spy on my sister and take pictures of her naked and things like that. So it was, it was pretty rough, you know, um, when I was going to psychiatrist therapists, they seemed to think that I was molested, but I don't remember it. I'm not going to say I was molested because I don't remember anything like that, but it was, it was a very sexually charged household. Um, he used to like watch what I saw as dirty cartoons, like heavy metal and things like that, that shouldn't be around a six year old, five, six year old. And my mom used to record porn for him. That was my first introduction to porn, you know, sitting at the table and she'd sit there in the living room and I'd turn while I'm doing my schoolwork or whatever and, you know, see blowjobs and shit like that. And I had no idea what the hell was going on, but I, I became really sexually aware from a very young age because of that. And, um, like I remember their friends peeping through the shower at me, like through the window when I take a bath and, you know, lots of weird stuff. That's all I'll say. Um, when they actually got a divorce, I went with my dad and I didn't see my mom again. I visited her once and yeah, I visited my mom and actually that's when he was trying to get me to tell her, tell him where she was living because he had me or she, yeah, he had me and I got to see her one time and they met me somewhere, her and her new boyfriend and took us out there. Sorry, see, everything's all fucked up. It's been a long time since I've like pinpoint, I know the situations, but to actually pinpoint what happened is a bit harder. So, um, I remember being out there in her trailer cause it was all trailers and looking through the photo album and um, looking at pictures of all of us together and I'd sit on the floor and I'd cry and cry and she'd yell at me, don't look at it if you're going to just cry. And it made me so sad because I just wanted my family back together. You know, I wanted my mom and dad to be together and I couldn't understand why they weren't. And it's like my whole life had been torn upside down and nobody really, you know, the whole, oh, you know, parents buy kids lots of stuff. You know, I never had that. They never really cared. I never got special treatment. I never got anything explained to me, you no, know, mommy still loves you, it was just, first you're going with your mom, then you're going with your dad, and then my dad and my stepmom told me that my real mom was dead, and I would never see her again, and that was traumatizing as well, and I remember having dreams about my mom, and as the years went by, I realized that I didn't even remember what she looked like anymore, and I was just, you know, my mom's dead. And I remember them laughing and telling me, your mommy's dead. Your mommy's dead. Your old mommy. This is your new mommy. And I just, it was just so hard on me. And my stepmom had a daughter and 
then she had a kid with my dad. So it was my half sister. And, um, I was like completely left out. Nobody really cared about me. And I was quite often hit and knocked around. I was abused by her quite a bit. She just, she was pretty fucking mean to me. Um, my sister told me later that after they sent me away, she's the one who got the brunt of everything, which really surprised me because when I was there, she could do no wrong. Neither of them could. It was just me. And it made me feel like, you know, my whole youth growing up, well, until I was 11 and they got rid of me, that there was something wrong with me. And I was just the one nobody wanted. My mom didn't want me. So she sent me to my dad. My dad didn't want me. So he sent me back to my mom and I had two sisters and they never got punished the way I did, you know, and like we shared a room, me and the older one. And I remember she was hiding snacks behind, you know, her dolls and her toys, not just snacks. She had lots of food and it was found and I got in trouble for it and I had to eat it. And it was like cookie jars full. Like it was so much stuff. I could hardly even like, I was up all night trying to eat it and I was getting screamed at and smacked around and I ate it. And then the next day at school, I threw up and I got sent home and she made me lay in the room in the dark all night long, skipped supper, skipped everything. Now that probably doesn't sound too bad, but it, it was pretty bad. Um, I forgot to kiss her bye one day before going to school and I ended up getting my ass beat down four flights of stairs because we lived in the top of these apartments. And another time I was memorizing times tables to two through 12. And I remember that I got three times four wrong. And I thought it was 16 and she beat me so hard that my lips started bleeding and my nose started bleeding and she stripped me and made me lay down naked in the bed, like on top of the covers without even anything to cover my nose with. And she had some friends come over and she was showing them around the apartment and she didn't even let me cover myself or anything. I just had to lay there totally ashamed, completely naked, you know, things like that. Like she'd get mad and she'd grab my wrist and dig her nails into my wrist and stuff. And I was chewing gum at night and I wasn't supposed to. And she shaved my head and sent me like around eight years old, sent me to school completely if I can bald. And, um, I can't even begin to tell you the amount of times I got smacked, punched, hit, scratched, you know, punished, sent to bed with no food, locked in other rooms and got the blame for things that my sisters had done. And then when it was found out it was them, it, they got, you sit on the couch until dinner. And with me, it was like, what the fuck, you know, I, I was in single digits having to help prepare dinner and having to like cook whole things by myself. Like I had to cook French fries and I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. And I remember I burnt them and I got in trouble for burning shoestring fries. And so I had to sit there and eat the whole, the whole thing by myself with only one glass of water to get me through. And, um, it was just a constant hell of always getting in trouble, always being smacked and yelled at, hit, hit, hit all the fucking time by her. And so that was my childhood. And then they had every aspect of my life mapped out when to wake up, when to brush my teeth, when to shower, when to go to school, what to wear. Here's your clothes laid out. I didn't have to think a single thought for myself. Summer vacations weren't vacations for me. Sit at the table, do extra work, sit at the table, copy from the Bible. No, you can't play with your sisters because even though they're three years younger than you, one's three years younger, one's three years younger than that, so six years younger. No, they can play with each other, but I can't play with them and their friends because if I play with their friends, I'm too old and it doesn't look right. It's not right. I need to go and just do schoolwork and copy from the Bible. And if I did have a friend come over, we had to shower together, which fucking sucked. You know, I was still shy and embarrassed. I didn't really appreciate having a shower with other girls and stuff. And, you know, being taken to nude beaches and having family bath time together with everybody in the tub and seeing my parents and my sisters naked. And then they decided that, oh, wait, I'm no longer wanted there. So I was kicked out and that made me feel even more left out. And then not to mention the two most traumatizing things. Well, one was extremely traumatizing. That's Christmas. But the other one was I had uh, use my watch as bookmarks. I used to read all the time and I couldn't find it. And it was, there's a carnival in town. And because I couldn't find my watch, I was punished. I was taken to the carnival anyway and made to watch as my sisters 
when on all the rides I wasn't allowed to enjoy myself or go on anything I just kind of had to tag along and we tried to find so many ways to let me go on a ride like my my little sister would beg can she go on the ride with me I'm too scared and it didn't work they saw right through it and I it was just as a girl that loved carnivals that was complete torture for me but it wasn't as bad as Christmas one Christmas I don't know I don't even remember what I did wrong but I did something wrong and on Christmas they took my presents and they gave my presents they gave my presents to my little sisters and I had to sit there with a smile on my face and watch as my sisters got all my presents and I couldn't tell them they were mine and I couldn't cry I couldn't look sad and I didn't get a Christmas that year I had to sit it out and to this day I panic around Christmas I'm like oh my god if I don't get a Christmas it just I don't know it's not me getting presents actually which is funny because that Christmas I was traumatized because I got nothing but I don't want to miss Christmas because it's a time that I like giving presents to other people I like the whole family setting and I'm making dinner and it's the one time of the year that I feel like I actually belong somewhere to a family to something and usually I don't I just I usually feel completely by myself and Christmas I can just kind of pretend that everything's okay and I'm like everybody else and I belong people care about me things like that and it always brings me back to that one Christmas where they just left me out of everything and you don't do that to a little kid you know you just don't and that stuck with me ever since then and then when I you know there's other things you know like I would get in trouble for laughing and playing and I remember one time one of my aunts came over and she had got me one of those little toys from the gumball machine and I was I had opened it and I was playing with it and I guess I was laughing too loud and I got in trouble my dad took it away and punished me and made me sit on the couch the rest of the day and my aunt told him that's really harsh why are you doing that and he didn't listen he didn't care and the next thing I know I'm being told that my real mom is actually alive and she's not dead and I'm gonna be sent away and he has no choice he can't keep me and I'm like I was ripped out of this home that I had known told my mom was alive and remarried and I was going to this whole new family that I didn't even know so at like 11 I was shipped off to this mom that I didn't even know anymore and who I thought was dead and like I just remember thinking you know what if she hates me you know what if she sees me and I'm not what she expected what if she doesn't care what if my new dad doesn't want me either because obviously I'm here I'm there I'm here I'm there nobody nobody wants me so they sent me and my stepdad was nice at first and then he did what my mom my stepmom did and he used to beat me quite a bit he was like an alcoholic and he like he'd get drunk and I remember one time um, like I love raw meat I used to I used to eat raw hamburger meat and um, I'd eaten a little bit of hamburger meat that they had out for dinner and he got pissed off at me and he threw me against the wall and had me there by my neck choking me and my mom came out and she's just like why are you doing that it's not like you can take the meat back out of her just leave her alone and it was like I was like 12 years old you know and I don't think I deserved that and uh, other times like you know he called me a dog he says he was just joking but like I've said before I, I can't I'm not good at taking jokes I have a really thin skin and I don't really see that as a joke because he would go out and buy plastic dog bones and we didn't have a dog and he'd buy a beware of the dog sign and again we didn't have a dog and he'd say that they were for me because I was a dog and we'd fight and I'd tell him you know you only brought me here as a gift for my mom because that's what he told me you know that the only reason I was there is as a present from my mom not because he wanted me or anything and he'd be like you're not a gift you're a curse and drag me down the hallway by my ankles or by my wrists you know uh, 
he didn't like the way I cut my steak at the dinner table and he'd get up and wrap his arm around my neck and like pull me off the table onto the floor and start beating me and my mom wouldn't even say anything like she didn't protect me at all she just let him do all this stuff to me but then she used to hit me as well like um I had a little glass bank my sister bought me and it was made up of tubes like three tubes kind of like this and it had a chain through the lid you put in quarter nickel dime and I learned how to break the chain and I took out a dollar because I, I got a dollar a week for allowance but I wasn't allowed to spend it and as a kid I wanted candy which I wasn't allowed candy or treats and things like that and um so I I went out and I spent a dollar. My mom found out. I came home and she was waiting for me behind the door. And she beat the shit out of me with one of her shoes. And I'm pretty sure she broke like a wooden spoon on my back as well. And she took the bank and she broke the bank on my head and my back. And then she kept beating me and beating me until I was just a hunker down in a ball on the floor. And then she just made me sit there on the couch until dinner. Like, I wasn't allowed to move or anything. Like, she would do shit like that. Uh, you know, one time she got mad at me because she told me, go get the the dishwashing liquid from the bathroom. And she, she named a certain brand. And I went to the bathroom. That brand wasn't there. And I was like, well, she asked for that brand. And I know she was so exact. I had to get the exact one or I'd get in trouble. And she got so pissed off at me. And she ended up beating the fuck out of me. And I tried to run away from her. I jumped out the, the window she ran around the window and caught me in front of the neighbor's house. Like, I, I had just gone through their gate and was at their front door about to knock. And they were sitting right there in the living room watching me run up to their house. And she grabbed me by my hair and dragged me back home and beat the fuck out of me. She looked through the dishes. If something was dirty, she's actually broken a glass bowl over my head. I have a dent in the back of my head from almost ear to ear and I could stick my finger into it and she said that when I was like three she was cutting vegetables with a big ass veggie knife uh, and I was crying for my dad because believe it or not I used to actually be daddy's girl before he left my mom and didn't care about me anymore and she hit me in the back of the head with a knife and she she laughed about it and said that it was funny because she was aiming with the blade and she said at the last minute the blade turned and it was the flat end and she's like you must have had somebody looking out for you ha 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 and I'm just like sitting here like traumatized like that's not actually funny and then later on she told me she was just kidding but that's not really a joke either and it still doesn't explain why I have this gigantic slash in the back of my head you know and um oh, so Growing up with them was really hard because pretty much, yeah, I got beat a lot. And when I went with my mom, she didn't, she didn't tell me when to shower because she figured I was old enough I should know when to shower, when to do stuff, what to wear. And I didn't because I had always been told what to do with everything. And so going into this new life, I didn't know anything. And... So I didn't, I didn't shower. I didn't know what to wear. I, I was a mess and she never stepped in and said, why aren't you taking care of yourself? And then I would have told her, I'm waiting for you to tell me, but she didn't. And I'd go to school, my hair, you couldn't even comb it because it was so ratty and I'd wear the stupidest clothes and I smelled because I never showered and and I was hated at school for it. People would call me Diana Rhea, because you know, my birth name's Diana. And they'd say like, avoid the noid, Dino Barks instead of Diana Sparks. And just, they hated me. Um, I remember in the fifth grade, uh, during recess or lunch, I actually got tied by the throat to the basketball nets. And um, I went home and I had rope burns around my neck and the playground monitor didn't actually say anything. And that was the only time my mom ever stuck up for me. And she went to the school and complained. I don't remember what happened, but I know that that's the only time she's ever said anything. Because throughout all my high school years, I was bullied and abused. And, like, 
they'd push me against lockers, they'd break into my lockers, they'd steal stuff, you know, I'd walk to school and have guys hold me up with broken bottles, tell me they were going to rape me. I, I got raped at 11 and a half, and it was my own fault, I guess, but I got raped at 11 and a half, I got raped by a boyfriend, um, a boyfriend's brother, actually, at 13, and I got raped by four guys when I was in high school, and then I got my ass kicked by one of the girlfriends because they bragged about it. Um, just growing up all around was really hard because I never knew who I was. I never knew, you know, I never knew who I wanted to be. I just, I knew I wanted to be liked. And so whatever the new fad was, I tried to fit in. I tried to be like everybody else, but I never was like, they always just knew I was different and no matter what I would wear or how I do my face and my makeup or whatever it was never good enough and people would just look at me like I was some kind of piece of shit which just kept you know re reaffirming reaffirming what I already thought as that I was completely useless and I was a nobody and so the only thing I could do was dress sexy because I had a nice body at least I was skinny like I was I topped out at maybe 113 pounds when I got pregnant with my son, but I was really, I was really skinny, and you know that's all that really matters nowadays is if you're skinny, not if you're pretty or anything. And um, I know I wasn't exactly pretty because I had big bushy eyebrows and I didn't wear makeup, and I just, I was real plain. But I had the body, and so I dressed for it, and then I started getting attention. But then I also got the wrong kind of attention. Um, I have another video up called my bullying video and that I talk more about like, what I went through in high school there and stuff so I'm not going to go into it here but um, I've basically spent my whole life feeling like a nobody like I'm not good enough um, I don't matter feeling lonely I didn't have a chance to be the kind of mom I wanted to my son and now I will never have a chance to be the right kind of mom because I can't have kids and um, you know I have my husband but it's not the same as having a mother or father uh, to know that your mom has been pitting you against your sister pretty much your whole life and ruining any chance for a relationship there that hurts and to know that your your birth father who I mean, you used to be daddy's girl. I used to love him so much. He was like my hero, you know? And to know that he's grown up and moved on to another family and has just forgotten all about me. Like, like I don't even exist. Like, how could you do that to your own child? But he has and he doesn't care. And he's told all that side of the family not to talk to me so everybody's actually scared to talk to me only one person has ever spoken to me and now we don't really even talk that much either my sisters won't talk to me um i i really don't have anybody out there yeah you know, it's hard for me to keep friends because friends think i'm weird i have a couple of fans that have followed me for a while i have a couple of good online friends that have followed me for a while I don't have any real life friends. Um, I don't know how to have friends anymore since I've been here in this country. Everything's changed and I'm not the social butterfly I used to be. I don't really even know how to how to act around people and I'm just creating a bigger and bigger chasm between me and everybody else now because there's like no hope for me to fit in anymore and everything I say and everything I do online is wrong and everybody hates me for it. I can never say or do the right thing without people judging me and thinking that I'm this horrible, cruel monster, which isn't true at all. Like, I probably have the purest, cleanest heart of anybody I know. And it's not conceited to say that because I know that what I do and what I say, my intentions are always pure. It's always exactly as I say it with no ulterior motives at all. But nobody can understand that in this day and age, which really sucks because now in this day and age, everybody's out for each other and they all think that somebody else has an ulterior motive, even if they don't, which fucks shit up for people like me that, that are genuine, which 
you know, it's why I found myself so hated all the time, and, like, there's somebody that goes to all my videos and dislikes everything, like, they're trying to make it a point that they fucking hate me, and they, they don't want to say anything, but they just want me to know, and it's like, why spread such useless negativity to somebody, like, what do I do that you hate so much, you know, do I intimidate you because you don't know how to be honest, like, why is that a problem with me? Why isn't that a problem with you? Why can't you just learn to be more open? Why do you have to hide behind a wall of hatred, you know? Anyway, aside from that, I've been married four times. I'm on my fourth marriage now, and it is the best. I will not talk about too much about husband number three, because I still talk to him. He's like the only real, I guess, friend I have. But husband number one, I got married when I was about 19 or so. Yeah, I was about 19. And and always, he was kind of like the perfect husband. Like, he went out and worked. and He loved Dorian like he was his own. And he always put us first and stuff. But then at the same time, he was really jealous and really abusive. And, like, I couldn't have any friends. He isolated me for about... Well, about five years. I couldn't even look outside. Like, I couldn't, if there's a sex scene on TV, we'd both look away, which is all right, you know, but like my metal magazines, the guy, if there's a guy with no shirt on, he'd scribble over it with a marker. And I'd do the same to him with the girls in bikini tops and stuff. So, you know, that was all right. But like the mailman would feel sorry for me and come by and give me like a card here or there, you know, just a friendly card, not anything shady. And my husband would see it and rip it up into shreds. And, um, he wouldn't let me touch Dorian. It's part of the reason I say I never got to be the right kind of mom to him, you know, but like I couldn't feed him, or change him or hold him or anything. I couldn't bathe him because he looks just like his dad. And so my husband, for some reason thought, Oh, he looks like his dad. You're going to change him and you're going to start thinking things like that and I'm like no actually not at all and so I missed out on all of his growing up because of that and I remember when he would go to work he would lock me in my room and he would lock Dorian in his room and I won't go into details about exactly how abusive he was but he was he was really bad um I found myself with my hand cut open, he cut open four fingers of this hand because I wanted to take Dorian for a walk and I ended up in the battered woman's shelter for it and stuff and uh, I've been beat up by boys a lot actually like I had a boyfriend um, in high school and he was like a popular guy you know it turns out he only wanted to date me because he wanted to fuck me and he dumped me when I wouldn't have sex with him and I remember he'd like tell me to hold his books in the morning and then he'd run off and go flirt with other girls all day and then come back to me and he had the hots for my best friend Brittany and he would beat me up in front of her so that she would protect me and he could kind of cop a feel of her while she was protecting me and he actually dislocated my jaw punching me in the face in front of her dislocated my shoulder as well and yeah, so this one, he was... Actually, they have the same name, too, which is Chris. Which is funny, but not funny. And um, so after five years, I was finally able to come back here. Or not here, but go back to El Paso. And then filed for divorce. And my mom got mad at me. And I tried to tell her he was abusive. Like, before we even moved away to Florida, uh, we were staying with her for a little while. And I wanted to take the dog for a walk. And he didn't say anything inside the house with her, but when we went outside, he pushed me against the bricks outside. He, like, scratched at my back and everything. He had me by the throat, by my throat. And he told me, how dare I think I was going to take the dog for a walk because there are faggots that live in the neighborhood, and he didn't want me to run into any of them, his words. And um, by faggots, he meant any of my exes or any just guys in general, not, like, gay people. And, um... I told her about it then, and then as later on, she said that it was my fault, because why would anybody hit me without a reason, and if somebody hit me, I must have given them a reason to do it, and I was stupid for leaving him, and she never understood why I wanted to get away from that, you know, 
even when she found out he was abusing Dorian as well, beating the fuck out of him and stuff, and to the point where I had to call Child Protective Services on us just to protect him. You know, she never cared, never understood. I got married again later on, and he was a massive jerk as well. I didn't want, I didn't want another marriage. I'd had a boyfriend before this one, and we were engaged, and he was the king of mind fucks. Um, he dumped me like 39 times the first year we were together, and he'd do things like he'd say he wanted to run off and elope with me because his family wouldn't let him get married or something, even though he was like 26. And um, so I went out and bought a $25 used wedding dress from the op shop, and when I told him I got the dress, he cussed me out and said, how can I do that to his mom when she's always supported me, what was wrong with me, and he let me have it, and then he dumped me. <laughs> and um, I had my first ectopic pregnancy with him, and I found pictures of him with strippers under the mattress when I was trying to dig out my diary to write about it, and he dumped me because I caught him lying to me, and he said I would never trust him again. And for Christmas, my parents went away to see my sister, and... I was supposed to spend Christmas with him because his family went away and he took me home uh, because he wanted to stay home alone and play video games all day. He didn't even care about being with me and I just curled up in a ball on the floor crying like I just so hard just to find somebody who would actually treat me like a decent human being you know and so that was shit and he'd tell me things like I was driving to your house and the wind was blowing in the opposite direction and I think that's a sign that we can't be together. You know, like he'd say stupid shit like that. Oh, you don't like house music, so I'm dumping you. And then, um, what was the other one? Um, I got a tattoo on my back without asking his permission and when he found out about it, we were at the movie theaters and he slapped me really hard, boom, right on my back, right on the tattoo and then he like walked out and left me there. That was during the Mexican, I remember that, exactly. Um, so, I mean, why didn't I leave? I didn't leave because I thought I loved him and he kept coming back and I just, my desire to be loved is stronger than my desire for self-preservation. So I would come back and when we split up, yeah, I was like, no, no more. And then I met this other guy, husband number two, and I thought that, he was the love of my life. We were like the same person, just in different bodies. To this day, we still have stuff in common. I see, um, like I've seen pictures of him and like we'll have bought the same pieces of clothing, jewelry, posting about the same bands, posting about the same things. And it's like, we're still like the same person, which is really weird, but he was really abusive mentally and physically as well. And, um, I don't really want to go into detail about what he's put me through because that is even more mentally draining than talking about my childhood, if you can believe that. I do have a whole video that I did make about that relationship, but I haven't gotten the balls up to post it yet. Um, and then from there, I had other boyfriends. Um, I mean, I had a boyfriend that I caught him cheating on me. On his birthday, he was over at my house, and he didn't log out of his Facebook, and there was a message right there on the screen of him hitting up this other girl saying it was his birthday, and his own girlfriend wouldn't fuck him, and he wanted to get laid, and she was offering to fuck him, and when I was like, what the fuck, he came over, and he started choking me, and he left me bruises all over my legs, and thumbprints on my neck, and I had friends there, and... The only one who helped me was one girl, not even the guys that were there. It was one girl came and made him stop, and I couldn't even turn my neck, couldn't talk, couldn't anything, and I had to go on light duty at work because I couldn't move my neck, and I almost got fired over it. I didn't end up back with him again, though. And then I ended up with this other guy that I moved to Georgia with, and um, he dumped me. And I got another boyfriend after that. And because I didn't wait around for him, he hated me for it. And when we moved back to El Paso, he pretended to be my friend. We were in Georgia. And he drove me back to El Paso, the U-Haul. He robbed me. He took everything I owned in the U-Haul. And my most important things, like a book I was working on, my favorite CDs, my ferret, 
I had a ferret that I was given for my birthday and I loved her so much and I don't know what he did with her and he took her and he took lots of my other stuff and he trashed it. He threw eggs all over everything that was left in there and he just dumped the truck and I lost most everything I owned because of him and um, and then I ended up uh, homeless after that because uh, a guy that I was with after him dumped me within two weeks because he said I was too fat for him and he was going to end up cheating on me and this and that and I was living with um, him and his ex-girlfriend and their kid and a roommate chick and I mean I cleaned up all the time and I tried to make as little you know like try to bother her as little as possible because I knew she didn't really know me I mean it was a huge house but I was a I was a stranger and she let me stay there and I I told her all the time I was so grateful I was like thank you so much thank you so much you don't know how much it means to me for you to let me stay here especially when I just got robbed my ex had written me this nasty letter saying that I was a cunt and he was glad I couldn't have babies and he hoped that I stayed infertile forever and I mean I still have the letter it was pretty nasty and he lied to my parents and told them all this shit about me and they stopped talking to me and um for months actually and I had no one and nowhere and so staying there was my only option and then after he dumped me he moved out and I was there with them and I mean they both hated me so much they made my life a living hell like I wasn't allowed to sit at the computer desk I had to sit on the floor like an animal I had no food I had no job I couldn't leave because when I left they go through my stuff and steal my stuff and I mean after having just gotten robbed I really didn't need that and um, they took Dorian's birthday money they took I think his his dad had given him like a hundred dollars hundred fifty dollars for his birthday and they said, let me borrow it for rent. And they borrowed it and they never gave it back. And I feel so shit that he got robbed of his birthday money and I never got to replace it because I never had the money. Um, and then he had like an Xbox and other things. And he went to go stay with his dad and he was super happy. You know, my dad, and yeah, my dad, which I understand because I, I don't have a family, you know. And um, when he was over there, his dad sold all his shit for drug money. And so that sucked as well. It really killed Dorian's enthusiasm for having a father or a family or anything like that. Those girls, um, they turned everybody I know, I knew over there against me and I was extremely suicidal. I didn't have my parents. I didn't have any friends left. I had just gotten dumped again. And then I was, I was really into this guy as well. And to make matters worse, he would come over and mind fuck me. And he'd like, come up and hug me and touch me and be like, don't you miss me? And I'm like, I do. Like, I remember the last time we were together, he was watching a football game or something and I would, you know, he'd come home from work and I would just, I'd kneel down at his feet and I'd rest my head on his knee and, you know, just sit there with him, just being by him was all I wanted. And he said he was going to go take a shower and he went and he was in there for like two hours because he was thinking, thinking, and he came down and he just like, dumped me and then he'd come by and you know flash all these other girls in front of my face and hit on his ex again in front of my face and stuff and like I mean he he like broke my heart you know and so I was really fucked over that one as well and stuck and then like they had told me when I moved in because they moved from their big house to an apartment because uh, the chick that owned the house she was leaving her husband for no reason at all. She just wanted her freedom. She wanted to party and be goth. That's what it was. And so she left her, her husband. And her name was Mo. So I'm not going to hide their names because there's no reason to. This is Jackie and Mo. Jackie was the ex and Mo was the one who owned the house. Mo's husband seemed like a really nice guy, but he was like in love with Jackie like everybody was because she's tall, skinny, long hair. And that's it. That's all it takes. And um, she's like everybody wanted her but she's to this day as far as I know still like oh, I have to be the prettiest oh, no threats from anybody like she actually started hating me just because some of her friends on MySpace added me and she felt threatened just that and that's why she turned on me which is so pathetic and stupid and I told her they're just friends I'm not gonna go after your guys don't worry you know I mean what the fuck is it really worth 
making an enemy with me just because of people on MySpace, but she did. And I don't I don't get why. I mean, she had everything, you know? And she actually used to look up to me and my second husband and learned everything. Her and her ex, which was my ex, too, they learned everything that they knew from me and my second husband. And they used to look up to us, and then she decided that she was too good for me and she was too good for everybody else and just made me into her enemy. And um, when we moved to the other apartment, they said, we don't have any furniture really. Can you decorate the room, bring all your stuff? And I was like, sure, you know, I'll bring what I've left. So I put whatever I had up and then they went and telling all their friends that I was such a bitch because I took over the whole apartment with all my shit as if I owned it. Like they do shit like that to me. And um, so yeah, like, I was trapped in this house, could only come out when they were asleep. I had an allotted time to use a computer. Even if they weren't up yet, I wasn't allowed to use a computer longer than that. And couldn't sit up on the chair, had to lay down on the floor. I had nothing to eat, nothing to drink. I sent Dorian away to his dad's because we were sharing a can of Parmesan between us. That's all we had to eat. We were starving. And, um, and of course, that's when they took Dorian's money as well. I never gave it back and I remember thinking because they kicked me out and I had nowhere absolutely nowhere to go I had nothing and I said you know I'm just tired of the struggle like I'm tired of not being wanted I'm tired of not mattering to anybody I'm tired of people using me and turning against me breaking my heart and lying to me and just making me feel like less than human like I'm just so easy to throw away and I'm tired of struggling I can't be a good mom to my son. I can't even go out and work because I can't leave the house. I can't put him in school because I didn't have any of the paperwork I needed. I couldn't go to my parents for it. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. And I said I wanted to kill myself. And that if things didn't change by that Monday, that was it for me and I was going to do it. And one person who said he was in love with me and said he was my friend actually drove me to Walmart to buy the razor blades so I could kill myself. And then he told me that I needed to call him when I was doing it so that he could come over, because he was a photographer, so he could come over and take pictures of my dead body to show my son. And not one person said, stop, don't do it. I actually, I didn't lie. I had one person, in Jeremy. Um, he was always kind of like, ish a friend not a close friend but someone that I used to like be really hot for and then it turned out he was like gay or something and we just became like kind of gossipy friends but not like friend friends but he cared enough to say don't be stupid don't do it but nobody else not one person gave a rat's ass and yeah so I had actually I had sleeping pills and I had razor blades and I was debating which way I wanted to go and I was going to do it and then my friend online, who was actually not a friend, he was an enemy, out of nowhere offered to fly me over here to New Zealand to save my life and to give me another start. And he is the only reason that I guess I'm still here. Um, that was husband number three. You know, um, We start off as enemies and up becoming friends. And then he was the only one who looked out for me, protected me, understood what I was going through. And... Um, I moved out from there, and I, I called everybody I knew. I begged them, please, can I stay? I have nowhere to go. One girl I met at a bar once, she let me stay there. I slept on her couch for about a month while I was waiting for my passport. And she was a college student, never was home, never ate at home. And I cleaned the house every single day. Every day I scrubbed. I kept it spotless. The fridge was empty, no food again. She brings like scraps home from college and her friends would eat out with her or whatever and I would dig through her trash can and eat the food in her garbage because I had like nothing to eat and I was starving and I just thought it's all right it's almost over once I get my passport I'll be out of here it's my second chance at life I'm gonna take it and my parents started talking to me again and so after a month at this chick's house I went back there to wait the other month and um that's when I found out that my dad had been diagnosed with um, throat, throat and neck cancer. And he had just found out, didn't know how bad it was, but he was going to have to go get surgery and stuff. And I remember that um, he had just bought this new truck and 
was a Dodge Durango and he was like a little boy. He was so excited and he, um, he had this remote and he would click it and then the back would open on its own. And he was like, so excited. Oh, look at this. Look at this. It's so cool. And you know, he hadn't even told my mom he got a new truck. He just got it. And he was just so hyped up about it. And he loved that truck so much. And, um, so I stayed there and there was still a lot of fighting because, you know, they were still, we had to calm down over the years, but he was still quite cruel to me a lot of the time. Like after me and my second husband had split, I moved to Las Cruces to get away from him because we were on again, off again, on again, off again. And I was tired of him coming back into my life. So I moved out of the city to get away from him and he went through the trash in my old house and he found my forwarding address and he found me anyway. But anyway, um, what was I saying? Uh, I was in Las Cruces and, oh, the car that I had was really shit. And, um, the brakes would lock up all the time. So I had to constantly bleed the brakes and you couldn't push down like at all. It would just stop. Maybe, you know, it would go maybe literally that far and it would stop. And it was scary. I'd use the handbrake a lot of the time. My dad said that he would have a look at it for me. And I was like, okay. And so I drove over. And had I had to drive across the mountain, and go downhill with no brakes, which is really scary. And I got there and I was like, I'm here. And he's like, it's like a 45 minute drive. And he's like, and? And I said, well, you said you'd look at the car for me. And he's like, are you fucking stupid? I didn't mean I'd look at the car now. I meant I'd look at the car at some point. Jesus fucking Christ, it's going to be dark soon. You really think I'm going to go out there and I'm going to look at this shit? And he just completely let me have it and I was like you have a huge light floodlight outside I didn't know it was a simple mistake you don't need to yell at me you don't need to yell at me for it and he did and I started crying crying my mom came after me and my dad came after me and it was almost physical and it was just it was just bad but um yeah so we were still kind of like that sometimes, but it had gotten heaps better, you know, as we both got older and calmed down and stuff. We were trying to establish a relationship, and we had finally gotten okay close. And I remember I'd asked him to buy me a gallon of milk, and I'd pay him when I had the money, and he bought me a gallon of milk and didn't make me pay him back. And that seems really insignificant, but my parents were tightwads. Like, the most I ever got from them for a birthday was $50 once, and I remember I almost fell out of my chair like, oh my god, $50. You know, I usually got towels wrapped up in a in the plastic bag from the store. They wouldn't even bother to wrap stuff usually. And, I mean, I'd have to pay them back for everything. So to pay for him to buy me milk and just say, keep it, and I don't have to pay it back to me was like, wow, that was like, that was so cool. And it's really pathetic and sad to think that such a small gesture was something that grand. But it just goes to show you how not close we were. And, um, I left there, flew over here and things were, were good at first with my husband. I don't want to go too much into detail because we're still friends and I don't want to violate his privacy, but, um, what was good went bad and he was a lot like my first husband without the hitting. Um, he was really overly jealous and hates everything and what he did was, he was like, the people here are shit, they're assholes. But instead of letting me find out for myself, he just kept me away from everybody and everything for four years while I was living with him and isolated me in a new country without any outside contact, accused me of cheating all the time and things. And um, meanwhile, I caught him on porn sites like all the time and it just really destroyed things for me. And I remember when I was here for four months, my mom was calling and calling and calling and she's like, please come home. I need your help because through dad, he had surgery and um, he's going through chemo and they gave him a flu shot. He collapsed and he can't talk and I don't think he's going to make it. Just, I need you to come home. And like, she begged me and begged me. And luckily my in-laws at the time, they flew us back. Let me see my dad. And <clears throat> he was okay at first. Like, <clears throat> he was up and down, up and down, up and down, and um, uh, then things took a turn for the worse. Uh, he couldn't really talk. He never got his voice back. He was so different, 
and um, like he couldn't drive anymore or anything like that. And I remember it was really sad because he had this new truck out that he had only had for at that time probably five months, and he used to go fishing all the time, and he'd be the handyman and go out and fix everybody's houses, and just he'd always be teetering around outside doing stuff, you know, gardening, building, painting, fishing, and all this, and he had this love for life, even though he was almost 70, and and then that was just kind of taken away from him, and he was on a walker and stuff, and then um, he went to the hospital for something, and what we didn't find out until later was that when they took his temperature rectally, the nurse actually punctured his colon, and he ended up dying of septic poisoning and he died in great pain after like two months of just agony and he went straight downhill and I remember we didn't know what had happened which you know he was in the emergency room and they took his temperature and we heard him scream how like really loud and didn't know like what had happened nobody said anything to us and um, he went home after that and then like his leg went septic and he it turned black his foot and he had to get his leg amputated and I remember that was on New Year's because I spent New Year's Eve New Year's night by his bedside and um, I just looked at the little stump where his leg used to be and I remember he had gotten both knees replaced and he was so proud of himself because he'd exercise every day and get his knees strong enough to walk on again and it was like all that for nothing and he's lost his leg and he didn't want to tell my mom because he didn't want to upset her but of course she knew and I remember when she'd come see him he would always keep it covered and put like a pillow under there so she wouldn't have to look at his stump so she wouldn't get upset and um, you know he'd raise that little stump up in the air and try to move it around and no more walking for him no more driving no more leaving the house um, he'd sit He'd sit like at his in his hospital bed because the last couple of months, because we were there for six months, and I went there in um, November, and by January he was dead. And um, I remember being by his bedside, and he'd look out and see the star on the side of the mountain. And he would never want the windows closed because he'd always want to look at the star outside because he never got to see outside. He was always in the hospital. And um, when he got to go home, he was so happy. Like, he was, like, thanking everybody. You know, the guy that wheeled him outside was, thank you, thank you so much. And I could see him when mom was driving and he was in the passenger seat and I was in the back seat. And I could just see him, like, looking up and, like, lifting his face to the sun. And like smiling and just breathing the air like he missed it so much and uh, he just wanted to be out and not even a week later he was back in the hospital again and he didn't want to go he was so pissed off he's like I don't want to go to the hospital just don't take me I don't want to go I don't want to go and my mom was like you have to go and I have this video of the neighbor carrying him. He came in and he picked up my dad and he carried him outside. My dad looked like a little kid in this guy's arms. And uh, that's when he went back and that's when his leg went bad. And we still didn't know what was wrong with him. Just that he was in so much pain. And he was in the hospital. And uh, they had him hooked to IVs. I don't know why he wasn't allowed to drink, but he wasn't. And his lips would be so sore and chapped and dry. And my mom would take a sponge and she'd dip it in ice water. And she'd put it in his mouth to wet his lips. And he'd suck at the sponge, try to get liquid out of it. And his arm swelled up because of all the fluids and stuff. And his skin would crack and dry. And she would sit there by his bedside and just rub lotion into his skin to try to help him. And then uh, we got a call he was supposed to be moving hospitals and we got a call at like seven o'clock in the morning saying that he had stopped breathing and they were going to work on him and they'll call us back and let us know what happens and they called back and said that they couldn't resuscitate him and he was gone and I remember that my mom had the phone I, I picked up the phone and I gave it to her and 
it was like on TV, it was so surreal, like she picked up the phone and she was just like, no, no, and then she just like collapsed on the floor crying, and I was just like, I had to be strong for her, so I didn't cry, and I didn't mourn over him, I just, I, uh, I made all the phone calls, I called my sister, I called my brother, I went to the neighbor's house, I told the neighbors, I told all her friends, I, I tried to organize everything, and then that night when everything was settled, it finally hit me, and I just cried and cried and cried and cried and cried, and I remember that when, when they had the funeral, not the funeral, the, uh, the open casket for him, we weren't allowed to touch his body because his body had a staph infection and we were there. It was my brother, my sister, my mom, me and my husband at the time. And, uh, like they were all up front crying and holding each other and comforting each other. And they like completely left me out. I was there by myself, just like, I'm not even here, you know, he was my dad too, like, whether we, we had it bad or not, he adopted me, and he was really the only dad I've ever had, because my other dad, he didn't want me either, and so I was there, like, mourning by myself, and what's worse, at the actual funeral, they came, and he was an officer in our, he had been in the military, so it's a military funeral, so officers are coming by, con consoling the family members, and they skipped right past me and consoled my husband instead. And it was like, I'm his fucking daughter and I'm like being left out of everything. And like, it just sucked. And uh, I'm at least glad that the last time we went in, I had Dorian, Dorian with me. And I said, go up and give your grandpa a hug and tell him that you love him. And so he did. And so at least he got to basically say bye to his grandpa one last time. But... I actually never did because the night before I was supposed to go see him and it was getting late and we were on our way and it was, uh, I don't know, it was like an hour before our busy hours were going to close and my husband at the time was like, we should just go see him in the morning, let's just go do something else for now and we'll go visit him first thing in the morning and I said, okay, uh, you know, this sounds good to me, I mean, it's what's the difference between if we go today or if we go tomorrow? Only there was no tomorrow. And that was it. So, you know, it kind of sucked. And now, you know, my mom has had a stroke and she has severe dementia and she doesn't even know who my sister is. She's like locked up somewhere. She's put away because she's violent and she doesn't know like, anything anymore. And I never got to go see her after her stroke. And I'm probably never going to get to see her again because I can't afford the tickets to go to the States to see her. And at least I was there when my dad went, but to miss, to miss my mom will really suck. Not saying she's about to die or anything, but she's just going so far downhill. Like I just really want to see her before she completely forgets who I am. Cause I, mean, I haven't seen her since like 2008. But, um, aside from that, so I came back here to New Zealand after my dad died and things just kept going worse and worse in my relationship and uh, I ended up um, somehow I ended up leaving and trying to start a new life and this is when I was with CJ and I was supposed to be starting a life for us got a, got a place to live, got all this shit and well, you know from the other video what he did to me, and so he left me high and dry as well. And uh, I had friends here, so I thought all the people that my ex didn't want me to be friends with. Sorry. And uh, they used to come over, and I thought everything was cool. Like, I had no problem with any of them. Like, I didn't fuck around. I didn't I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't badmouth any of them. Well, their greatest greatest thing was that they would talk shit about each other and I never understood that they, that's what they all thought friendship was was to talk about each other behind their backs but be nice face to face and I, I'm I'm not like that so I never played those games and uh, they're all at my house for a party this is before I met Logan 
and I was like, okay, you know, we're all here, you know, whatever. And then they left, they went home, and uh, the next day I woke up and I got a message saying, what happened last night? Because somebody sure does hate you or whatever. And I was like, what? And I looked online and there's all these pictures of me, like, these nasty, like, demotivational posters. And there's fake websites up about me, like, all kinds of shit from these people. And people saying, oh, I had to choose a side and I, I don't regret my decision at all. And I'm like, what the fuck just happened? I, you were just here last night. And then by the next day, you guys all hate me and you're posting these pictures about me and talking about me. And it didn't end. Like, it was so bad to the point where one person who wanted to be friends with me refused to stick up for me. And instead, she made a fake profile just so she could still talk to me without anybody else knowing. Instead of just saying, look, I'm going to be her friend. And they... they yeah, she hid, which I lost a lot of respect for her for doing that, because that's not friendship, you know? And, um, when things finally calmed down, and some of them that weren't involved in the main group were still talking to me, after that is when I met Logan, and I got with him, and then, boom, it all happened again. Like, they all came down on me, and then it was pedophile, pedophile, pedophile. That's all I heard. Pedophile, pedophile. More demotiv demotivational posters were made about me, and the cops were called and like all kinds of shit and I had people knocking on my door I had people calling me and hassling me saying well, I'm not gonna let you around my kid you know you pedophile think of how this looks for your friends it's like what if you're my friend then you wouldn't care and like I have a lot of the screenshots of these conversations as well just people just attacking me over it and death threats as well and um, after that we had to actually move and like go into hiding just to get away from it and, and then it calmed down again, finally, um, but then the David and Shani and Alex, those main ones, they still all hate me, and I have no idea why these were people that I thought were okay or okay with me or my friends, and they just one day just decided that they can't stand me, and they've held this, like, grudge against me ever since then, and turned everybody about, like, around me against me, and, like, here... What I have to live with here are people thinking that I'm psycho, I'm crazy, I've told people I want to kill their babies, I've threatened them, I need to be locked up. They've apparently tried to cycle a petition having me locked up, and yeah, uh, constant, constant. Oh, she says this about people, she talks bad about people, even though I haven't said what they've said that I've said, you know, and they all believe it. Like, oh, photographers won't work with her because she talks shit about people, and I'm like, what? I don't. I tell the truth. If you've said something about me, you've said it, and if I've said something back, it's because you've attacked me, and I have I have all the screenshots to back all this stuff up. There's a girl that even made a, a page about me on Facebook saying that, there, that I was a cyberbully, and it's like, I'm not a fucking cyberbully. Defending yourself is not being a cyberbully, and that's where people get it wrong. Like, it's okay for all of them to gang up on me, to give me death threats and to fucking make me fear for my family's safety, but it's not okay for me to stand up to them and say, if I see you, you say you want to fight me so bad, I'll fucking fight you. That's apparently being a cyber bully. You know, I, I just say, just leave me alone if you hate me. Don't keep up with this stupid shit. I have nothing to do with any of them. So this is why I don't want to go to any of the gatherings that they have here because they're all there and I just know they're going to get snarky and Logan's going to go after them. Like, I don't even have to raise a finger. Logan will do it. And then I don't want to see him in jail over these people that aren't worth it. Um, what else? Uh, oh, and then you all know that, you know, I took in those two fuckers that needed a place to stay. And then they robbed us. You know, every good thing we try to do for other people ends up being something negative that comes back on us as well, which sucks. And, um, and then there was all the bullying I went through last year or the year before that I almost just clocked out of. And, um, yeah, so that's my life in a nutshell, basically. Um, I don't even know really what the point of this was. I, there's so much stuff that happens to me all the time. And the fact that I'm so different, I think different. I present myself differently. And the fact that I, I have no family, I have nobody in person that's like a friend I have no interaction with anybody like literally no real life interaction if you if you're all by yourself 
it's been uh, almost 10 years now since I've had like any kind of a real life or social life or anything with consistent people. Um, if you're a hermit for like 10 years, do you really think that's not going to change you? It's going to change you. You don't know how to pick up on social cues anymore. You don't know how to interact with people. You don't know how to talk to people. This is why I talk so much on camera because I'm talking to myself and it's the only thing I know how to do. I don't really know how to talk to anybody anymore or anything. And, um, you know, I went through my time of being really negative and really angry and hateful all the time. And I'm not like that anymore. I'm always trying to better myself, be a better person, be more the kind of person that other people can accept and understand and stop hating on. And it's hard because the things that I want to say and ways I want to express myself and I feel like I can't because if I do, I'm going to bring the wrath of the world down on my shoulders again and it happens and and I have no way of stopping it and it's because I'm so soft that it affects me and they know it affects me so they keep doing it. If if they knew it didn't affect me like really at all, then they would completely stop and most of the stuff does not affect me but there are some things that hit close to home that do. I've been through so much more than what I've said in this video. This is such a condensed, like, an out of order, fucked up video. Um, I don't even know if there's enough here to help anybody with anything, to be completely honest. It's just me just talking. I, there's nothing I can really offer anybody, but if any of you guys ever need to talk, I'm here. I'm not so great at talking, but it doesn't mean I can't try. Um, I think no matter what life throws at me, I will probably always have a kind heart. And that is not a good thing. It is a really bad thing because having a kind heart in this day and age with no thick skin to protect it only leaves you open to get hurt. And get hurt I do and get hurt I probably always will. And either the end of the story will see me finding a way to deal with it or just finding a way to end it <laughs> and I hope it's the former not the latter um, I don't want to die I'm not like oh I'm so emo I'm gonna kill myself every time I turn around um, but uh, sometimes it just becomes so hard to live in a world that you just feel like you don't belong in because people never cease to tell you that you don't belong in it they love to tell you you don't fit in you don't belong nobody wants you you're all alone. You're too ugly. You're too weird. You're too old. You, you know, whatever. And um, you just try to fight day by day by day. And you fight and you tell yourself that you matter and that somebody out there cares and that you're not going to listen and you're going to be strong. And each day is another day and all you can do is face it head on and try to fight for your right to exist. And so that's what I do. I just tell myself, why should I give up when everybody else is the problem? Like, they're assholes. Why should I, why should I suffer so much because somebody else just wants to bring about more pain? You know, I have a right to live as much as everybody else does. And so I'm trying to just live and live my life and not be a horrible person. I mean, even though I get angry and I bitch and complain, I'm not a horrible person. And I would never set out to do something just to hurt somebody. And, um, I don't know how to toughen up and I don't know how to change. It's been too long that I've been like this and I don't think that I can change. I, I don't have the mental ability to build up these walls. And, um, yeah, so I don't want to keep blabbing. So I'll just end it here and say that if you've watched and understood, thank you. And um, this is really embarrassing, and uh, this is going to be very, very, very hard for me to post. So I hope that you appreciate that I've made this, because this was this was way more emotionally trying on me than I thought it was going to be. I thought I was just going to fly through it, and that's not actually what happened at all. Um, I don't know where all the emotions came from, but there it is. And, um, yeah, I guess I'll see you guys next time. And, um, Fingers crossed that I don't get too much hate on this video. <laughs> oh.